I'll let y'all know when y'all go live. Mm -hmm. and... Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Gray. I'm the co-founder and president of Fayetteville Police Accountability Community Task Force. Tonight, we have our Black History evening, Series everyone. 2022. My name is and this is where is our land? Is this our land or is our land in Africa or where is the Black people's land? Tonight, we have one of our partners moderating, Nakia Smith from Black Voter Matters. Nakiti, Nakia here is the Southeastern Eastern Regional Organizer for North Carolina. Hey, Nakia. How are you? She will be moderating for us this Favo Pack for our Black History Series, and she is going to be asking questions to our guest speaker, Chris Ottman. Chris Ottman is hey, a real estate broker and an automotive car sales. He is also a motivational speaker and coach mentoring in real estate. Is that correct, Chris? Yep. Okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about which land is our land and how does it look to us in the next century as we continue to go on and live on this U.S. continent. So I will go ahead and pass this to Nakia and any questions please put in the chat and feel free to ask those questions in the chat. I was also add the links of Black Voter Matters so you can link on if you want to help and assist with volunteer work, canvassing for the upcoming elections, as well as telephone banking. And then of course, if you wanna get in contact with Chris, I will add that he has a 5 a.m. broadcast that he goes into motivational speaking. So let's go ahead and get it started. Nakia is your floor and thank you once again for coming to Bayville Pack Black History Series. Good evening, everyone. As Kathy said, I am Nakia and I'm here with Chris Aitman. What's up, Chris? Hey, what's up, what's up? All right, Chris. So it's my understanding that you and Kathy met and you guys were having a, she met you at a discussion where you were talking about reparations for Cumberland County or is it Fayetteville? I was talking nationally, honestly. <laughs> National well, let's talk about that right now. Oh, so give me a little bit. So what is reparations? I hear this talk often, but I, I, I hear very things. So can you tell us what is reparations? Well, uh, reparations just repayment for like war crimes that get that's um, done against a certain group of people or a certain nation of people. So you know, like back in the 1800s, the Jim Crow and um, everything that's been done to um, our people, black people, um, is just repayment for you know the disadvantages that we have we we have had and generational disadvantages that we we currently have. So it's pretty much just like the Jews had reparations from the Holocaust for the suffering of other people, um, us as black people, I believe we deserve reparations as well because our ancestors never given a proper start in this country to begin with. So reparations is really just leveling the playing field and repaying the debt owed to the people that was mistreated and mistreated, abused, tortured, kidnapped, all, them, all that type of stuff. Um, during the process of slavery and um, the process of, you know, the European continent conquering Africa and part in, you know, kidnapping us and taking us over here as prisoners of war. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. And what would that look like here in the United States with, you know, our government and all? To us, it's... Okay. Well, I, I feel that to be honest, I feel I, I don't see it happening. To be honest with you, um, honestly, I feel like if it was going to happen, it would have been happen. It would have been happened. You know, people been fighting for it. People been mentioning it. And as you see, politicians of nowadays don't mention it, sweep it under the rug. You know, all we get is um, pretty much handouts that's not really moving us forward, but getting us comfortable where we're at in a you know a lower class state. You know, welfare, section eight government housing and things of that nature that kind of makes our people more complacent than uh, motivates them to move forward. So reparations would be something more realistic 
that can elevate us to a different um, social bracket. And okay. I mean, rep reparations, not only finances, it's also, you know, land ownership and other things of that nature. So let's talk about it, land ownership. Um, our topic tonight, of course, is which land is our land? So what would land ownership to you, what would that look like in regards to reparations and what Black Americans should be, should have? I mean, now, nowadays it's like, it's kind of, it's almost too far gone. You know, it's, it's to the point that everybody has made their tags on land. So even if they really can't give us no land because everybody else owned it individually. So it's no, they can't, unless they take it away and buy it from some people and give it to us. And then even then um, we'll still have problems with, with, you know I mean? We'll still have problems. We probably still wouldn't be satisfied with what land they give us. They may give us the worst land you could possibly get. And as far as repatriation, which is, you know, going back to the motherland, uh, we have been so disconnected from our roots that, you know, we don't even know where to start. You know what I mean? Where, where should we go? Africa has been parceled out into over 50 countries. Um, you know, most of our people is from West Africa that's been sourced, but we don't know what tribal, what tribes we was from, what land we was from. So it, it's kind of confusing at this point because they have, buried so many lies and hidden so many truths you know so it's kind of like i said i don't see it i don't see it manifesting um in our lifetime and maybe not even in the future generations i think the best reparations nowadays is self reparations and you know the best change is the change that starts within us individually well t tell me more a little bit tell me a little bit more about self reparations what does that mean um self reparations is really um taking what's yours like you know taking back your power um not necessarily taking it violently but you know doing what you got to do to progress in this system that we live in right now and um taking the necessary steps in order to get to a better financial st um, status you know making the sacrifices you need in order to elevate you know putting in the hard work having the self-motivation the courage the drive and the effort to take a step further and you know not really not really wait on other people to do things for you instead you start doing the things for yourself and you know giving back to yourself and elevating yourself to a higher plateau this is sounding a lot like that 5 a.m club um <laughs> as we mentioned um christopher has a podcast a daily podcast and it's called the 5 a.m club because it's at 5 a.m um, but let's talk, let's, let's rewind a little bit and talk about repatriation. Um, Ghana offered, was it last year, the year before they all run together since COVID, but Ghana not so long ago was offering for black Americans to come back to Ghana. What's your opinion on that? Um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's good to have um, a nation of people that are seeking to represent us on a, you know, I mean, a global scale. So, I mean, I think it's beneficial in a sense to have that dual citizenship. So if something happens to us in this country or injustice, we have a body of people, a nation of people to represent us opposed to something happening to us while we are a US citizen and we really don't have no real representation. You know what I mean? We are labeled as black people, but it's not no nation. You know, it's not a nation of people. We are still um, citizens of the United States. So we still blend in with all the other people. So. Um, a lot of our efforts as far as representation has not really went anywhere. You know, only time they really listen to us is if we act a fool. Right, right. Well, so getting into that then, without acting a fool, how, what are some steps that we can take to organize or to mobilize to get ourselves, um, you, you said it earlier, to elevate ourselves? What does that look like? Self-elevation, um, it's a process that really starts with yourself and really connecting with people who has that mindset. A lot of people don't have that mindset. A lot of people have mindsets of complacentness, um, just taking things for what it is, stuck in comfort. So I think the first step is finding like-minded individuals who have that mindset of self-elevation, um, surrounding yourself about around positive environments, positive situations, soaking in and um, assimilating positive information, positive books, positive videos, just changing our daily habits in order to elevate. 
Okay. So what are some things that we can begin to incorporate into our daily habits? Um, I would say waking up early. Definitely. I think a lot of people like to sleep in. <laughs> That's why I do the 5 a.m. club, because 5 a.m. is a great time to wake up. A lot of people complain that it's not enough hours in a day, but, you know, you sleep in the way three to four hours out your day, just waking up at nine or waking up at eight, you're sleeping a lot of your day away, and then you wait to nighttime, and then you're up late, and, you know, the late hours are not really productive hours because everybody else is asleep. So um, I think waking up early is definitely a start. Um, and just developing more habits, um, having a purpose. You know, I think a lot of people go throughout life without having a definite purpose or a chief aim in life or some type of direction. So they're just drifting along life just aimlessly. And that's the cause of depression. That's the cause of complacentness. That's the cause of lack of motivation because you have nothing you're aiming towards. You know, I think um, we set our goals so small and we're afraid to set bigger goals and set goals that are so-called out of reach. So I think think bigger, aim higher, believe in yourself and trust the process and stop trying to take shortcuts. Stop trying to take shortcuts. That's 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 a huge concept. Um, and you keep bringing up the concept of complacency. All right. So, you know, COVID just happened. I lost my job, my kids, you know, I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Um, but you mentioned terms like complacency. How does one, you know, how, how, how do you elevate? How do you self-elevate when, you know, it just seems like the world is against us or our world, our immediate world, meaning here in the U.S., it's against us, you know, taxes are high, inflation, so on and so forth. How do you look, how do you have a positive outlook for towards that? How do you not be complacent? How do you feel empowered? It's a matter of perspective, you know what I mean? If you feel the world is against you, then the world is against you. If you feel that the world is yours, the world is yours. Um, everything is a process, you know, uh, even if people are living paycheck to paycheck, you know, we got to understand we applied for these jobs, you know, the job didn't come and say, hey, you're going to work here. So you're not being forced to do anything. Um, I think the main thing is not living in fear and being bold and being willing to take a risk on yourself and take a chance on yourself. I think a lot of people are complacent and, you know, it's easy to make up excuses. It's easy to have something to um, blame your situation on instead of taking accountability and saying, okay, I can do more. Okay, I don't like this job. Let me work towards finding a better job or let me work towards um, making, a, making a way for myself. And I think a lot of people want the easy way out and there's no easy way. You know, the easy way is the hardest way because when you take the easy way, you still have to cover your tracks and go back and fix this and fix that. So the easy way out is, you know, working a job, um, going to get a job. And I said, don't work a job, but I'm saying if you're not happy with your job and you know what I mean, you got to understand that you apply for that job. So you apply yourself for that position. So the same way you apply for that job, you can apply yourself to a higher position. You can apply yourself to get more out of life. And it's a process. It's not going to be easy. And you just got to understand that. Okay. So applying myself. I'm, I'm out here. I'm ready. I'm open to the idea. What are some tangible steps I should take? First thing is change your mindset, change your perspective, change your viewpoint. Um, we, we, are, we tend to think with destructive thoughts. So destructive thoughts attract destructive and undesirable situations. So if you're constantly thinking destructively and you're constantly thinking about undesirable situations, that's what you're going to attract. So I, the, the first step is changing your mindset and molding your mind to have more constructive thoughts, have more positive thoughts and um, believe in the process, trust the process and don't give up because a lot of people give up at the first sign of struggle, at the first obstacles, but it's only when you overcome them obstacles and you persevere through them challenges that you will see success. Success will never exist without failure. And we got to understand we have to fail. We have to learn. We have to gain wisdom and we have to overcome them barriers in order to be successful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We were talking earlier about the concept of Black utopia. Um, can you explain to us what that means to you? Black utopia, um, I think when I first came with the concept in 2015, it was more of an um, intentional community 
where we all come together, we put our time, our money, our resources, our effort, and everything together and buy our own land and build uh, maybe our own community within that land, build our own houses, have our own infrastructure, um, taking care of our, our basic needs in life, wa water, food, clothing, um, health care, and all of that. And just coming together as a collective instead of complaining about the government system and complaining about how the government system is holding us back and we can't, um, we can't succeed in this system. Instead, we should just put our resources together. If we really care as much as we say we care, if we really want to change, why won't we, why won't we just put our resources, our time, and our effort together to build that change that we seek? Um, I was working on it for a minute. Um, I guess I kind of put it on the back burner because maybe, I don't know, maybe if I would have kept on going, it would have been manifested now. But um, I just didn't see a lot of cooperation in that. I've seen a lot of more people would rather complain and protest, which is to me the easier way. So then to come together and actually put your money where your mouth is and go out and, you know, build it, build the change that you seek. So, yeah. Um, as someone in the chat said, that requires, and us to move forward requires heavy leadership or requires a lot of leadership. What's your thoughts on that? We gotta be our own leaders. I mean, if you want change, you are the leader of the change that you seek. Uh, I think that's the problem is we always seeking for that one leader. And then when that one leader perishes or that one leader dies or that one leader um, contradicts themselves, you know, we all fall with that leader. So it's, we got to be leaders within our own realm. You know, I, I can be a leader in this, this position, but I can't be a leader in something that I don't know. I know nothing about. Like you can't, I can be a leader in, I mean, like I can be a leader in real estate, but I can't be a leader in, um being a doctor you know what i mean so it's like we have to be the change we see we can't keep on depending on a leader because the leader is going to let us down some way or so some way or another you know what i mean let us down as far as dying let us down as far as contradicting themselves let us down and for as far as a lot of things so i think we have to be our own leaders and collectively we can lead each other I like the con I like what you're saying about collectively leading each other because take for example you are a real estate broker um as I'm in a house search or a house hunt, I have to look at you as a leader, but then I also have to look to my spouse and so on and so forth. So I like that. I like what you're saying about collective leadership. Um, Lord, I'm taking notes. Um, so talk, let's talk a little bit about networking. Um, how does one, how do you how to achieve Black Utopia, you're saying, um, and I understand it as Black collectivism, like us as Black people working more together as community and unity, right? So mm -hmm. how do how do you network to even get there? Uh, man, really, for what I've done, I was just spreading the word, uh, spreading the word and spreading the vision and um, just think tanking and letting people know about it. But like I said, I just don't think that um, our people truly want that, you know, to be honest with you. I mean, I think a, a small portion of us do, but like I said, it requires putting your money where your mouth is and putting your resources. And it requires a lot of sacrifice to even get that done. And it's going to make you uncomfortable. It's not going to be a comfortable situation starting off something or a project of that scale or that, um, of that magnitude. So um, I'm not saying give up on it or nothing like that. But I, I say like, really to network and build that, it just requires a lot of dedicated people who really believe in the vision and who's willing to sacrifice a lot to make it happen. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm a little tripped up. So <laughs> <laughs> you're saying that, you know, we, we need to do this but you're saying that black people don't want this? Yeah, exactly. Oh, why do you think that? Because it's like, it's either you want to be a part of this system or you don't, you can't be one foot in and one foot out, you know? So it's like, I think inside they kind of want it, but you know, the actions speak louder than words. So it's like, cause when I was, when I was really trying to build black utopia and I was really trying to, you know, speak on building intentional communities and coming together, putting our money and resources. I was all in. I wasn't one foot in and one foot out. And, you know, like I said, it, it requires 
you gotta it's gonna make you uncomfortable like everything that that you rely on you have to kind of detach yourself from and have your mind focused on the vision and i think that a lot of people are not ready for that and not can't fathom making a sacrifice that big and i can understand that i mean maybe i was quote unquote i don't even like to use this word but to a lot of people i was unrealistic in my efforts and i mean i can i can take that i can understand that but um i mean it takes that to build something of that magnitude like i said and if you know it can't can't be done with just one person it can't be done with just five people it requires a a, a decent amount of people to even start a project that big especially if you don't if you don't have the financial backing to fund projects so that means you have to crowdfund you have to think of alternative ways to create revenue um, we got to put hundreds of different systems in place in order to make it function you got to have a whole bunch of leaders in different fields and it, it's it's a it's a big plan and it requires a lot of cooperation and, and dedication okay so this particular um event that we're hosting or this particular talk that we're hosting is being sponsored by nc block and nc block is an organization that um wants to implement community-based strategies um to shift the conditions of black culture black communities here in north carolina um and again strive towards that so when you have organizations like nc block you know they I would think would be the leaders in this opportunity. I also think that there is that community of people who want to work together, right? So it's my thoughts, this is my opinion, that there are black people that want that. So how do we work together? I mean, we gotta let people lead in their own fields and we gotta understand that we have to um, come together under one umbrella. You know, there's so many different organizations and that's cool to have different organizations, but to have one, one nation of people, you know what I mean? Like, and really understand that we need that collective. Like all these organizations, like, you know what I mean? You got organizations that help organizations, you got coalitions as well, but it's still the, the separation that hurts us the most and not really being unified as far as representing all, you know, it's always, I think it's more politics in the, in the like, black power movement than any other movement you know like especially like um growing up in it and like experiencing from like when it first kind of started taking off on social media until now there was just so many politics uh what it what it is to be pro-black what it is to be this if you're not this way now they're calling you a coon and now they're calling you this and you know what i mean it was so many rules and it was so much separation within the thing it was almost impossible to build because everybody got their own mindset on what it means to be black and what it means to be pro-black and what it means to do all this. And I was even sucked into that. And I was even um, cutting people off because of certain lifestyles they have. And it's not, it's not about that. It's not about trying to control people. It's about trying to do something for the whole collective, regardless to what your lifestyle is, regardless to what race your wife is, regardless to all of that, you know, it's, it's about, doing something for the collective of people regardless it's, it's all of us it's not just the the straight black males and the straight black women it's the gay black males and the gay black women you know what i mean it's not just the all fully black it's the mixed people too it's not just the black people who got black whites the black people who got asian whites who got white whites they still a part of us and it's understanding that we are all one and in order to even move forward on that type of magnitude and get the type of representation that we need especially in the local governments and the federal government system we would have to really solidify what we are and this is our nation and this is our body of people that represent us regardless to what your belief says regardless to you know all the petty stuff that we let get in our way and separate us yeah i will say that yeah pettiness is probably um and personality differences get in our way a lot. Um, and even when we want to work together, sometimes we are hindered in that because of those things. So how do we put it aside? What do we do? Because we, I mean, look at gangs, look at, you know, look at politicians, look at, there's always a, a them versus them, you know, um, and they truly believe what it is that they believe, and then they're going against someone else. So do we just put those differences aside? 
um, for the, how, how do you come together? I mean, you said it, you got to put the differences aside for the main cause. We all have this definite purpose as a collective to, you know, start a community like the Jewish have, start a community like, you know, um, the Indians have, start a community like the Chinese have and the Koreans have, you know what I mean? Like, until we put our, because they don't care if you're a gay Korean, if you got this view, if you got, you know what I mean? They don't, they still got the community. You know what I mean? Our community is so scattered in it's not completely our fault because it's conditioned behavior, you know, and right. it's through, you know, just not knowing better for the most part. But until we really put that stuff aside and the people who have the power, you know, because regardless if we like it or not, money is power, you know what I mean, in this in this system. And I think to the people who have who have the power really enforces that or until individuals like us gain that power to enforce that um it's i ain't gonna say i ain't gonna say it's impossible but I, i'm gonna say that it's very unlikely that we will have a community that supports each other the way we envision without really yeah i don't i just don't think it's it's, it's, it's likely that we're gonna have that to be honest without okay. having people in important positions, enforcing that and leading by example. Okay, so one thing that's really um, been hitting me in my heart a lot lately is this seeming upheave in violence. Um, you know, you, you live in Fayetteville, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So living here in Fayetteville, you know, it's you turn on the news. It's like every day there's some type of shooting or some type of, you know, someone got injured or someone got killed or something like that. Right. And, you know, it's we're, it's happening in our communities now, statistically, because I'm not going to say black on black crime. Statistically, crime happens in, you know, crime happens amongst people who look like each other. So there's white on white crime. There's black on black crime just for just it's to crime set the tone period. Here. Yeah, it's crime yeah, period, yeah. right? Um, but how do you convince these people who are seeing this happen in their communities? How are you? How do you convince them, someone like them, to um, that we need to work together to elevate together, and that would be the better condition for Black Americans? How do you convince somebody of that? I mean, it's I, I would say it's not our job to convince them. You know what I mean? It's just our job to lead by example, the leaders that we do have, the people that really want this to come together and just lead by example. If me, you, Kathy, and 60 other people start really doing an intentional thing as far as intentionally pulling our money, our resources, and our time together to start doing um, businesses, to start you know, competing as a community, it's gonna show by our works and then that's gonna convince people through our actions. You know, going, knocking at people's door, telling them, we've been talking for too long you know we've been trying to convince people for too long it's time for us to just do it and lead by the example and be the message that we preach and just show by our actions and if they're not convinced then they're going to be left behind once it's built they, they're going to be too late and it was they're not going to be the founders so it's kind of like we got to convince ourselves more to convince them we got to convince ourselves and convince each other those who are like-minded those who want that change and put our time, money, effort, resource together to start making these infrastructures that can promote the change that we seek. I like that, promoting infrastructures to promote the change that we want to see, right? Um, pinning that, does that, that's what I understand it to be as power. I work for Black Voters Matter, and those are the things that we want to see improved to build power in our communities. Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. Definitely voting. Um, <clears throat> I know a lot of people are against voting, but it's the same people who are against voting complain about the laws, complain about the situations that we in, but we don't understand, like, this country was built off voting. So if we can really um, start being more politically educated and, I mean, and knowing our politicians, knowing what they stand for and holding them accountable and just at least just trying to get a little bit of information um, voting matters. I mean, voting matters, black votes matter, and all votes matter. And that's what we got to understand. We got to stop getting the mindset and attracting that negative connotation that, oh man, my vote don't matter. My vote don't count, but it does count. 
And a lot of laws and a lot of things get passed over our heads because we don't participate and we don't let our voices be heard through that vote. And, you know, collectively, we can change a lot of things. Like, for instance, why we got ABC stores and not individually owned liquor stores? Because we don't vote. We don't, we don't, we don't vote to change them type of things. So everything is ran, ran off a of voting system. So it's, it matters. And we got to just get out that mind state. Because I used to be one of those. I ain't voting. My vote don't count. But it, it, it does count. It really does. It's ignorant to think it don't. Because if it didn't count, a lot of laws that we as Black people helped pass through our voting, it matters. Um, the presidency, Barack Obama, would never have been president if it wasn't for the Black vote. Joe Biden would never be president right now if it wasn't for our vote. You know what I mean? So it matters, and these politicians know it matters. That's why they target us for our votes. That's why they make campaigns specifically for Black people for our votes, but they still don't, and I know I'm going on the tangent, but they still don't do things to really elevate us in a true light. You know what I mean? They use us to get in power, and when they get in power, they forget about us. And we gotta start noticing that, and we gotta start acknowledging that, and we gotta start doing things our own. You know what I mean? Why we gotta be Republican and Democrat? Why we letting other systems that they create to separate? Why can't we just have an independent party, our own party that we can, you know? So it's like, they separate us so much that our power doesn't, um, amount to as much as it can be because it's so much separation within this system. But if we can agree on one thing and that's just the investment and generational wealth and building something that we can pass pass down, building that legacy, then, I mean, we can get a lot further through voting, through um, civil, um, civic action, through um, industry, through technology, just through all areas of people activity. You know, we can we can advance if we, put our minds together and work as a collective. Um, you just said a whole lot that I want to bottle up and like take with me <laughs> on my <laughs> on my day-to-day -day work stuff. So, you know, I'm going to be coming to holler at you again because I'm going to need you to say all of that all over. Um, one common, one common uh, misconception about Black Waters Matter as an organization um, is that we're only concerned on votes. No, we are concerned with building power in the Black community. Um, just like you were describing so can you outline because we were talking about infrastructure can you outline what um building power in our communities would look like like what jobs are those what industries do we need to what industries do we need to kind of overcome or take over or to get involved in what does that look like for our communities i think um really in our communities I, it's like when we say our communities it's kind of um deceptive in a sense you I mean because well i'm saying it because we're talking about you know we were talking about black utopia okay. so if we so we're talking going about to... so are we talking about like the places we live in or are we just talking about um yes yes so places the places we live, we live in. in so like the places we live in like we don't own nothing you mm -hmm. know and i think that's the first thing we don't own the buildings we don't own nothing really like and if we do own it we own it on an individual standpoint maybe this black man own this building this black woman own this building and this mixed person owned this building. But as far as coming together, forming an organization and start buying properties and buying pieces of land and buying things of that nature, that's how we can really, uh, hold on. I'm sorry, um, I, had a, I had a phone call. I'm back. I'm back, can you hear me? I can hear you, sorry. Oh, I can't, I don't know, I'm trying to, let me see if I can put it on Do Not Disturb. People don't never call me until I'm doing something. One second. Let me see. Of course. Uh, I okay, I'm good. Um, but yeah, like um we gotta we gotta start focusing on collective ownership. You know, collective ownership. It's good to have things individually, but it's better if we can all come together and pull our resources to have that collective ownership so we can better manage and better government I mean, and, and govern them things. Um, Business-wise, I think, you know I mean? The main thing we need to practice also is guerrilla economics. I mean, we always seek to make businesses and sell back to our own people while everybody else is making business selling to everybody, you know? So it's, it's like, we gotta elevate our minds on businesses and do more than just sell clothes and food, not turn down the food and clothing industry, but it's more different business approaches than that. We gotta educate ourselves. Even if it's self-education, we have to 
expand our minds to different fields. Uh, definitely technology is something we definitely got to get in because that's the future. That's the way the world is going. And that's, that's something that we don't have. Um, manufacturing, like we got to be manufacturing. We got to start having our own exports, our own factories, our own things. And um, as far as jobs is concerned, I think we got to set the standard on on jobs. Like as we see, like corporations don't pay their people that much, I mean, per hour. So, I mean, we can't say we won't change and then we, we hire our employees and we paying them the same amount of money that the competition is paying them. Let's, let's do more for our employees. Let's do more for the people who work for us and maybe they'll work better for us. Maybe they'll like their job and give better customer service in these restaurants, give better um, production in these factories. We got to build some factories. We definitely need some factories. We definitely need, um, we just need infrastructure on a bigger scale. We got to stop thinking so small, stop thinking from the top down and start thinking from the, uh, I mean, stop thinking from the bottom up and start thinking from the top down. I like that. I like that. Um, so from infrastructure to, we were speaking earlier about other systems. Um, I find in my line of work that um, it's cute to try to play other people's games. And by other people, I mean non-Black people's games. So when we look at certain systems, um, you know, we're still Black people trying to maneuver and navigate a white system in certain certain things. So even I'm going to say um, cryptocurrency, because there's a crypto mining plant coming to Fayetteville. Um, crypto, you know, you got a lot of Black people in the crypto game and stuff now. Do you find value in us learning and creating our own systems so we're not playing in the same, the same muddy pond? Because when someone else makes the rules for us, how do we win? Yeah, I believe in that. I definitely, I'm definitely a strong believer. Is create our own system, create our own things, you know. However, you know, we got to infiltrate what, what they have as well, you know. So it's like a double side thing. Like, I'm not saying just disengage from the system, you know what I mean? But focus on creating our own, you know what I mean? Instead of just making other people billionaires, let's focus on making each other billionaires. Let's shift that focus to that instead of, you know, Okay, so same line of thoughts. What about legislation? And you know, you want people to get more civic minded and <laughs> Black Voters Matter, I absolutely agree. Um, but you want people to get more civic minded. And I absolutely believe that we are left behind because we don't quite understand a lot of things. Um, but let's talk about like certain laws. Um, how do we get more politicians and how do we get them? Because you said, you, you brought up a great point. They will target us for elections. And speaking of, we got an election coming up. Um, May 17th is our primary. And they are going to, even locally, they are going to target us as Black communities. Um, but you said that we need to hold them accountable. What does that look like when we have things like, we have Fayetteville PAC, for example. Fayetteville PAC is working hard to make the police here in Fayetteville be accountable to us because they are here to serve and protect. But then there are laws in place that protect them. So how do we navigate that as a people towards our black utopia? I mean- That got complicated, I'm sorry. No, it's not, it's not too complicated. I mean, it's always gonna be resistance in this system. It's always gonna be because it wasn't built for us. It wasn't built, um, it was built for the people who founded this country. So it's always gonna be resistance. And the black utopia mindset is more so create our own system. You know, if we was to, like fence, <laughs> if we was to all migrate, right? If we was all migrate to, let's say like 20,000 of us was to all collectively migrate to a, a country hit town and buy up all the land in that country hit town, right? And start building in that town. We don't got to worry about this system because we can have our own judicial system. We're going to have our own in that vicinity. Like on a national scale, it's a little different. But once you start, once you population is population rules, you know. So if you got more people, you can have more votes. You can push more laws. You can pass more things. But um, in these systems that we are, that we're fighting against, we're going to always have resistance because we still have the people who are with this stuff, the people who are 
down for the laws that we don't like in place with resisting us and doing it. So, I mean, that's why black votes do matter because the more of us who do feel that these things are unfair that's in place, if we can let our voice be heard, that'd be more population, that'd be more people going against these things. But um, I, I just feel that it, it, it's gonna, it's gonna be a process. It's definitely gonna be a process, especially educating people on voting and getting people to understand the benefit of it. So it's, it's definitely a, a uphill battle. I ain't saying it can't be done or it won't be done. I'm just saying it's gonna be, it's gonna be met with a lot of resistance. It's gonna take time. It's not gonna happen overnight like we are wanted to. It's, it's, gonna, it's something that you're gonna constantly have to go out there and be heard and go out there and educate people and let and kind of force people to care because people say they care, but they really don't care. You know what I mean? You know, people so individualistic, they care when, when they like, it's like they care for vainglory. Like, you think like, like with George Floyd in a sense, like all them people who was out there marching and pro protesting can't, you, you won't see all the people on the voting line. You know, they care for the vainglory. They care for the recognition and say, oh, I, I was at the George Floyd. I, I did this and I did that just to, you know, defend it. But when they, you got to be there when it really matters, though. Yeah, marching protesting, that's good. But what about voting? Let's see them lines in the voting stands. Let's see them lines when it's coming to um, put our money together and, and start communities and start businesses and start infrastructure. So, yeah, I ended there. <laughs> no, no, no. That's Listen, again, my job, I completely hear you, bro. Um, completely hear you. I'm going to bring up something a little sensitive, um, and I don't mean to be insensitive to anyone in the crowd, but uh, Fable Pack, our um, host of tonight's event, they are working diligently to protest. Um, okay, we got one question in the chat. Um, so I will hold my question and we'll go for the one question in the chat. Kathy, do you want to read that question? Yes, I'll read it. <clears throat> now, since we talked about policy and you brought up policy, Chris, um, the question is, how do we make politicians aware of policies that need to change, for example, by changing, calling a supervisor before 911? So off-duty police officer calls his supervisor instead of 911 when he did a shooting. That's the question. I mean how did the policy start? You know, it's a process. You gotta just follow. You got you kind of gotta like work it backwards. Like, how did that policy start? And what are the steps required in order to change these policies? The process of changing anything. So I'm not sure. I'm not really politically um sound enough to adequately answer that question on how to change it, but I know it's a process to it, just like the way a bill becomes a law. It starts off as a bill, then you get lobbyists to to, you know push that up and then, you know, so it's, it's definitely a process, it's just following that process and and getting enough people to support you when it's time to vote on did that process go. And another thing she mentioned, um, Nakia, I said your name right? Okay, another thing, another thing she mentioned was um, the election. Man, this election is one of the biggest elections um, really of our time right now, man. It's almost all the seats of the House of Representatives is gonna be up for election, that's who, we need to be focused on voting for as the House of Representatives because them are people who represent in the state when it comes to these big issues, you know? I mean, we always focus, no, we want the Senate is good too, but the House of Representatives holds a lot of weight and they hold, a, they're one of the branches of government that matters a lot. And we just got to get these old people stuck in their ways out of, out of office. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think, because America is not an only black country, so I don't think it's only about <clears throat> black people. Being in office is about people who care and people, because it can be some black people who can be against us too. So it's about really knowing their policies and really knowing where they stand on. We got to get more younger people in office though, more younger people who want to see change, who want to see things better instead of worse. Because as long as these people who've been in office since the seventies are in office and we keep on allowing them to get the power because we don't care enough to you know, vote, things are going to be slow changing. But if we really start looking at the people who've been in office and vote them out of office, that's when we're going to see change. There's no reason why we got 
we got these people in the Senate seat because they were just in the 70s getting paid all this money and nothing really changing. And they really don't care. So it's like, we got to really start like dummying up. And it's, I mean, if you were born in the, in the seventies, you were born in the eighties, you were born in the nineties to the two thousands. It's like, it's time for us to start getting them seats. You know, too many people in the sixties and the fifties and the forties that still in office. So, I mean, we gotta, we gotta do it for our generation. It's time for us to take control of power as a generation, not even just as a race, because a whole, our whole generation of people think different, you know? than the status quo of the older people who was alive during Jim Crow, who was alive during segregation, who was alive and probably partook in that and probably, you know, got that closed-minded mindset and that old school way of thinking. It's a new era. It's a new time for evolution and change. So we got to really pay attention to our politics and stop voting these older people in that don't care about us. Uh, you just completely took me off my next line of questioning, so I'm going to go with it. Um, I love how you brought up that you know, we, we got these, there's going to be some people that kill me for what I'm about to say, but we got these old people in office, right? You know, like our president is in the seventies. My parents are 60 and I can't, I, I don't let them handle certain things because, because, um, so, you know, you, you got a president running the country and he's 70. I too agree that we need to get some fresh blood in our political realm. Um, and again, we got this election coming up, um, and I'll go to, yeah, we got this election coming up. What do you look for in a politician that you want to represent you? Because we especially have a local election coming up. We got mayor, we got city council, and we're going to keep this C3. So we're not going to promote any one candidate. But I do want to know what is something that we as Black people working towards a Black collective or working towards a Black utopia, what should we look for in our politicians? What are the things that we want them to say to, so we have a better idea that you know what, this is somebody who is looking out for us as a community, Black community. Just legitimate representation, you know, being, fulfilling your promises, you know, um, showing by your actions that you actually care, you know, and not just by your words, you know, like we've been promised a lot of things and a lot of them promises still ain't been fulfilled by the president now, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, and really, grassroots politicians, you know what I mean? People who, regular everyday people like you and I, you know what I mean? We got to start uplifting more grassroots politicians instead of getting these seasoned politicians who was in the game for this long. You know, we got to get more people from the grassroots, people who go through, go through the same struggles as us and support these people. You know, I think we got to push away from Democrat and Republican and start going more so on the independent route because as you see, that's causing division in the country. As you see, you got the far right, you got the far left, and honestly, me personally, I can agree with both sides of it. You know what I mean? I can agree with some Democratic um, views and I can agree with some Republican views. So I view myself as more of an independent because I am independent. I think we got to push that independent party um, way more and, and own that. Let's own the independent party. Let's stop going red or blue and let's go yellow. Let's go something more neutral, something that can suit our people and not, not harm our people because these two parties have harmed our people as a community and used our people and manipulated our people for so long. So how much longer are we going to let this happen? How much longer are we going to be the poster child for these parties and while we can just do something independently and support each other and grow that way? That excellent segue to a question that comes from the chat. Um, when running, candidates tend to show up at like Black, Black Lives Matter rallies and stuff like that, right? Do you believe that that hurts or helps their campaign? Um, it helps it. I mean, it helps it because, you know, it's a public eye, though. Most of the time, it's not they doing it because they know they're going to get that Black vote. So we got to understand our votes matter, man. They want our votes, man. You heard when Biden was going against President, um, with President Trump, when President Trump and President Biden was going for um, election, right? Man, every time I turn on the radio, I hear ludicrous on the radio. Black people, I ain't never heard nothing like that. Not even when Obama was running. I didn't hear so much emphasis on black people voting until Biden. And that shows y'all how much they use our people, how much they want us, and how much our votes really, 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 really matter. If they're going to go to this extent, to the point they, they literally point us out and signal us, they ain't saying Chinese people, come vote. They ain't saying Indian people, come vote. They ain't saying, hey, white people, vote. Why, they, why are they targeting? That's, to me, that's kind of racist in my mind. Why are y'all targeting black people like this? Y'all not targeting any other minority group to vote but black people. 
y'all not y'all not saying, hey, white people, y'all need to come vote. But it's black people. You know what I mean? Like we don't we don't question these things, but I, I always they say see the forest through the tree. I always see the tree through the forest. You know what I mean? I always see that one tree through all these other trees that's blending in. I always think deeper and I'm always more analytical. And I, I keep my thoughts to myself a lot when it comes to stuff like that. But we gotta understand that our votes matter, man, way more than we think. And it's to the point that they're targeting us to vote for them. And we still ain't see no change in this long. These people don't really care about change and they do, they want it real slow. You know, we gotta go independent, man. I really feel that, you know, we gotta step away from this Democrat Republican stuff because that's been tearing our country up. It started a whole civil war. So it's kind of like, you know, we gotta step away from that and start being independent thinkers and start being um, about what's right and not just taking the side of something because your party stands behind it. You, um that's that's word that's i i completely agree you were talking a little bit ago about um policies and laws um and how we need to again hold these people we need to have hold these people accountable and you were talking about an important race um talking about the representatives right um one other important race very important race that we have coming up is our judges both our local judges are on the elect or on the ballot this year as well as our um so our district court judges as well as our supreme court judges here in north carolina and as you may be aware um it was the supreme court that decided our redistricting case um, and redistricting is huge because that determines who actually represents us um, or where our representation lies in the state. Um, <clears throat> so judges is an important race that we have coming up. Um, and that is who you were talking about, who changes policies. Policies aren't laws, but policies can turn into laws. And so we need to work on judges to make sure that lo those laws aren't enacted. So the 911, policy, um, we don't want to make that a law. Um, and so we need to make sure that we have lobbyists in place to make sure that those things don't become bills that become laws. Um, but speaking of judges and speaking of redistricting, <clears throat> do, can you tell the people a little bit about how important redistricting is towards Black people, towards Black utopia? Can you talk about how, how important that is? Um, as far as redistrict, redistricting, that's a, that's, that's a tough word right there. It's a tough word. <laughs> I know, right? As far as that is concerned, <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what they're, I'm not too privy on what they're, exactly what they're doing, but I can tell you, like, if they widen, make the district bigger, it can, um, it can kind of mess up your representation. So, like, if you live in a lower income area of Fayetteville, so to speak, you know, since we have Fayetteville and your area has been expanded and you got, it's been expanded out and it has the higher income level and the higher income level um, area kind of overpopulates the lower income level. So a lot of things is, I mean, a lot of people in the lower income level is not going to be represented properly because it's, it's too entangled. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, you got to keep the district um, in a, I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep the district so each district can be represented. And if somebody in a higher level is running that district, it's like a lot of things for that lower side of town is not gonna be done. And they're gonna put that higher part of town in priority, if that makes sense. I'm, that's not my forte, so I'm just- It makes sense to me. <laughs> Um, okay. it makes sense to me. Um, so let's let's get into that a little bit deeper, right? Um, one of the detriments to that type of redistricting that you just spoke about, where you have higher, did you say income? Yeah, high, higher yeah. income. Yeah. So if we have, we're going to make a fictitious district. So if we have District 11 here in Cumberland County, and District 11 um, primarily used to have low income residents right and they redistrict it so that it now is primarily higher income but there are still lower income people that live in that district right um <clears throat> we were talking about investments and how as black people we need to get more into investing and stuff like that but we know that when you have these higher incomes these people are able to back politicians and you know make 
higher contributions to campaigns and stuff like that. So when it comes to Black collectivism or Black utopia and working towards us getting power in our communities, would you say that that's a good reason that we should be investing so that we can, we too can, you know, build up those communities and perhaps even back politicians if we wanted to? Yeah, definitely. Politicians are both. <laughs> I mean, we all know that, man. I mean, it's, it's sad to say and People know, like, politicians are both. Like, you give whoever giving the most money to the politician, the politician's going to work for that person. That's who's paying them. That's who's feeding them. That's who's supporting their movement. So definitely, we definitely got to um, buy some politicians and uh, have more grassroots politicians that we don't have to buy. They genuinely care, though. I think that's the main thing, because I think a crooked politician is the more the people who want to be bought. But if we get people who are like us like even like the judges i don't know the requirements of being a judge but i mean if they voted in office that should be it shouldn't be no big criteria we need to get people that look like us and them judge seats judge seats not just look like us who came from the same struggle who can empathize with with these um with, with, with people because like what i've noticed in a lot of court systems a lot of these old 80 year old judges who just throw the book and railroad people like for like petty crime sometimes, or, you know what I mean? It's really, it's really biased judgment, especially when it's time for sentencing. You'll give um, a person of color 75 years, but you'll give a person of your color um, 10 years for the same crime. So I think things are like that is, it's just through the lack of empathy, lack of, um, just lack of- Lack of empathy well, on whose part? Lack of empathy towards the judge, like the judge don't have no empathy, like an old white judge most of the time is not going to have empathy towards a young black male because how young black males have been portrayed in the media, through culture, through news, through whatever, through their own um, preconceived notions of young black male, they, they look at us as, they look at, look at us as criminals already, so they think they're doing humanity a, a, a favor by sentencing, sentencing this dude a maximum possible sentence opposed to a white dude who's not portrayed in media, who's not portrayed in all these things as a criminal. So I think we got to get more people who empathize with us in these judges, in these judge seats, like for real, because if not, then a lot of stuff is going to, a lot of, a lot of things we're fighting for is going to fall in vain because we don't have nobody on our side or nobody who can empathize and relate to our struggle and where we're coming from. Okay. So, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, you have so many politicians and judges are sort of politicians. And so with judges race races coming up with um, some city council, mayor, uh, senator, all those other races with all of them coming on the ballot this year, we have a long ballot, by the way. But in this meantime, how do we determine or what are some some advice you want to give to the people watching um how do we determine who's for us and who's not because like the question was asked earlier you know they're coming to black lives matter rallies or they're coming to fellow pack rallies um for jason walker and whatnot and as you said that looks good to their campaign but you mentioned a good point like grassroots um politicians are good because you know they have more empathy or they can't be bought how what what are some things that we should be looking for for that or you know to go towards that <clears throat> i think i think that's what um your organization is for black votes matter you know i mean i think you got to be on the forefront of educating these people on these politicians i don't know if you can do it with the c3 or whatever but um it, it, you gotta have some type of because we don't know about them i mean people are not going to take due diligence to really learn about these politicians and to do diligence, to study and all this. People ain't got the time to do that. So we need some type of outlet or some type of informative person, you know what I mean? Or a group or organization that's gonna inform us on where well, this person voted on these policy, this person, you know, and I think that's where your organization kind of comes in. It's not only telling people to vote, but it's also informing them on who's running, who's, what they stood for, what they did, interviewing these people, you know, holding these people accountable. I think Black voters matter to hold these politicians more accountable and really um, unveil them and get some interviews with them, um, research their record, research research these people and let us know. I mean, 
that that's really the main thing. Like start going live, start doing more publications on the social media, on the YouTube that informs our people locally at least about these politicians and about who who's um who's running for office because honestly people don't be knowing man people just mark the stuff out because of democrat or republican you know you don't even know none of these people policies and i'm being honest like my first time vote i ain't know nobody but barack obama you know so it's like people don't know and we don't have enough people informing us we can't trust cnn we can't trust these other news networks and they don't even cover on a local scale even our local news networks is only covering national news most of the time so we need more people in the grassroots more people um more younger people man and like i said it's, to me i mean the black thing and the white thing yeah but it's more young versus old now it's more of our new generation versus this older generation so we need more younger people who are interested in this who are leaders i said everybody i can't be a leader in politics because that's not my field but like someone like you who are who's knowledgeable who understand these terms who understand these things you are a leader and people like you, they are the leaders and they have to lead and they have to take initiative to start informing people of this, of, of what politicians are doing and who's really for us and who's really for the people and who's really for themselves. Thank you for the shout out and just adding more work to my plate. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, as an organization, we do or we hope to help inform voters of what to vote for, not necessarily who, that's not in our scope um, legally. So um, we, we do want to help inform people of what we're voting for. Um, so I appreciate opportunities like that where we can talk to people like you who want to bring our communities together um, so that we know, you know, who we should vote for in our communities. Um, so let's get back to, we're going to wrap this Christopher up. Christopher Amen for mayor. It. No, I'm just playing. Uh, no, I'm just playing. Chris Amen for mayor. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> hey, do it. What's up? Do it. I mean, we do. <laughs> Let me shut up now. Do we have any more questions, <laughs> Kathy, in the chat? No, we do not. But we okay. do need some people to run. So I mean, run for mayor, run for whatever you want to. I mean, we honestly believe that this land is our land. So everyone should be able to run without a doubt. Yeah, and I'm gonna go definitely. ahead and say that we do need more people running because we as Black people are constantly being, um, there, there's constantly that whole lesser evil being put before us um you know not calling anybody out but there was a certain election that we all participate that we participated in you know kind of recently um and yeah we were kind of put with two candidates that we might not have liked um but we picked the lesser of the evil so people think so um run that that's what i'm gonna say i'm gonna say run um chris how can people contact you on Facebook, man. Facebook's the easiest way. Add me on Facebook, um, Christopher Aitman. Um, I'm pretty much on all social platforms. If really type in my last name, you'll find me. It's not common at all. So A-T-E-M-A-N, Christopher Aitman. Um, call me if you want. It's Christopher uh, with a K. Email me. Yeah, Christopher with a K. Yeah, Christopher with a K. Definitely add that. Um, but yeah, just hit me up on social media, man. I'm pretty active on social media. I'm pretty frequent on there. So if I get a message, I'm not like to the point where I'm just getting too many inboxes to see y'all inbox. So if y'all really want to reach out to me and talk to me or whatever, or see how I can help you guys or how you can help me, um, I'm I'm pretty responsive. Just hit me up. Okay. Well, we appreciate you um, taking the time out with us this evening. And don't forget, y'all, he has a daily podcast and that's on Facebook. Yeah, it's on Facebook Live and it's on the Wisdom app. I actually moved it from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so, you know, it's still the 5 a.m. club, but, you know, you got to wake up at 5 to make it to 6. So it's still the 5 a.m. club. I just want to cater to um, a more time zones, the central time. So it's going to be 5 a.m. central time, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, I'm still doing that Monday through Friday. If you want a daily dose of motivation, if you want to think a little deeper, if you want to you know, have somebody to spit some affirmations. We do affirmations. Um, we read some quotes and I just do like a little, little lecture, I guess, and just motivate people as motive as I motivate myself. You know, um, 
I don't want to tell you how to run your business or whatever, but if you push that to, you know, like mm, 730, some more of us would actually, on I the know. East Coast would actually. But then attend. it's going to cut it to my day. It's going to cut it to my personal day. I just, I just can't get up there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do it one day. I'm going to do it that day. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it one day. Um, but you see, that's the point. That's the point because mm. I want to, I want to motivate people to get up earlier. And if they really, you know what I mean? So that's part of the motivation is to have a show early. So in order to catch it live and be a part of it, you got to wake up early. So I, I'm going to inspire people to wake up earlier and, you know, conquer their day, beat the sun up. I am so much more creative at night. So I need somebody who is willing to mobilize us creatives at night. Um, not me though, because <laughs> I'm tired. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So we learned how to reach you. Uh, we want to thank um, our host, Fayetteville Pack. Fayetteville Pack, Kathy, co-founder of Fayetteville Pack. How can we reach you, ma'am? Well, you can reach us at Fayetteville Pack Facebook page inbox because we're currently working on our new website right now as we speak. So we'll be getting that all height, hyped up, you know, 3D level, maybe HD. But anyway, or you could reach us at babylpack at gmail.com. But you'll Yay. see us in the street. Because either way it go, we're in the street. And you guys are currently in the, in the streets every night. We're on day what, 50? 51. 50. We're on day 51. With Jason Walker. Jason Walker, tell do you want to give a slight little little thing, little blur? Well, Jason Walker was killed by off-duty deputy sheriff, lieutenant deputy sheriff here in Cumberland County in January 8th. And we're still waiting on the complete uh report on from the NSBI. Now the FBI is involved, but we're just waiting for a public service announcement on where the case is right now, autopsy report, something. But we're on day 51 and we usually go out to the market house every day at five o'clock p.m. and protest the, we want to get Jeffrey Hash arrested, um, just like anybody else would have been arrested if they killed someone in the street. So that is our objective. But our other objective is definitely to get a uh, civilian police oversight authority here in Fayetteville and Cumberland County um, because we need to make sure our citizens are able to discuss and decide reprimand for police misconduct, not our elected officials. Well said, ma'am. Well said. And I'm Nikia with Black Voters Matter. Kathy has put my um, information in the chat. You can reach me at blackvotersmatterfund.org. And that's all we got this evening. We want to thank you for joining us. Oh, and shout out to our sponsor of this event, NC Block. NC Block. NC Block. <laughs> Kathy's got their screen go. share. This is NC Block, and we encourage this Fayetteville Pack. We are members of NC Block since 2016 when they first started NC Block, and we encourage people to actually join them when they're talking about the Black infrastructure or like the Black Fruitopia that Mr. Chris was talking about. This is the type of thing that we're talking about. Is the North Carolina Black Leaders Organizing Collective to come together and have a collective structure in our Black communities to build our Black communities up where we won't have any police and we can have our own schools, our own process, our values is to get away from white supremacy like we was just talking about and how it looked for us to have our black political power and our own insanity. So we ask you to join. If you want to join as a member or join as an organization, this is the website. And Fable Pat, encourage you to join. I believe Nikki is also part of North Carolina Block. Is that correct? So yeah, this is what we got to do. We got to keep it moving. So we yeah. encourage you to join and we thank y'all for coming tonight. Um, and joining Fayetteville Pack, and we'll continue our last series tomorrow night. Um, but before our series tomorrow night, we'll have a public service announcement. We're redistricting to update you on how that looks, where are our maps in North Carolina, and we'll also have another public service announcement. But I appreciate everyone's time, and you have a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you for having me.